Good afternoon, everybody. We are in the hearing of the case 13678, Ana Martil de Gomez against Panama. I would like to greet the state and also the representatives of the victim. And I would like to give the floor to the executive secretary so that she can continue with the hearing. Thank you, Madam Vice President. The first case has to do with the alleged a responsibility of the Panamanian state for the arbitrary removal of Ana Matilde Rola Gomez Rilova, the alleged victim, from her position as general attorney through a proceeding of the Supreme Court of Panama that allegedly violated her legal guarantees. On October 18, 2018, the uh, commission uh, presented the uh, visibility report and the case is now on its merits stage. The hearing is aimed at receiving statements by the petitioner. One of those statements is from the victim, Ana Martinez Gomez, and the second is from uh, Mr. Guevara, that is one of the fiscal of the prosecutors present during the case. And also we will also receive allegations and statements regarding the merits. Uh, thank you very much. We will start with a statement from uh, Mrs. Ana Maria Gomez. We will request you to indicate your full name, your date of birth, and your place of residence. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ana Martina Gomez Rilova. I'm a Panamanian women, woman. I live in Panama City in, the, in Panama. So we will start your statement. You will have 10 minutes for this part of the hearing. I would like to greet uh, all the commissioners, the honorable representatives of the state of Panama. And I would like to start the first stage that will be uh, followed by my colleague Macarena Saez. I have a set of questions and I would like Antonia Matilde to answer them in the order. How many times, how much, you, uh, how long have you been a uh, fiscal uh, prosecutor? Uh, five years. Well, it should be by constitution of 10 years. Which petition the former president made to you, your reply to that petition, and why the relationship with him deteriorated? He made two requests. The first one, he wanted a former president in prison. He called me or more than seven times in a single day to imprison President Valladares. And at the same time, he requested the transfer of an official, Isabella Largones, to the Security Council. He wanted her to be transferred so that he uh, tell the embassy of the United States that the phone tapping were in charge of the attorney's general office, that is myself. I rejected his requests and led to a set or series of events after that. Mrs. Anna Matilde, could you answer the second question, please? Because there was a technical problem. The second was to transfer a drug uh, area official from the Attorney's General Office, Isabel Averes Mergor, to the Security Council. And this was a message to the Embassy of the United States so that they knew that I was in charge of the phone tapping because he she was one of my officials. Uh, the president and the president of the Security Council insisted on calling me several times. Uh, you were mentioning phone tapping that were related to uh, prosecutor, uh, prosecutor Archimedes Sainz. He ordered those uh, phone tappings and uh, of which uh, crimes was he accused and why uh, you requested the petition to uh, phone tapping. He was a prosecutor, a secret prosecutor. He ordered the detention of a young woman and the father of that woman said that uh, the prosecutor was uh, requesting money from him. The, then I was requested for, by the attorney general uh, or for, to uh, 
carrier phone tapping. I was following all the measures that were necessary to fight corruption, the Inter-American instruments, and also I also had the power of a domestic law that gave that power to the Attorney General of the nation. Anna Matilde, would you like to share with us if those phone tapping that you ordered were finally implemented? And if that is not the case, what were the stages to uh, stop uh, prosecutor asking me this science? The substitute prosecutor said that there was a problem and none of the phone numbers that were in the list belonged to prosecutor Archimedes Sanz. None of those phone numbers belonged to him. And in spite of all those diligences, he was condemned uh, because of corruption because he had requested money in advance. And we were trying to uh, surveil uh, or to uh, watch them because he received $600 from the victim and those notes were marked. He, those $600 were in their bank movements on the same day that he received the money deposit. So you were subject to a criminal sanction. What were you accused of? Uh, on what the uh, opinion was based? I was accused of abuse of power and infraction of my public duty according to the article 336 of the criminal code of 1982. I received a sanction of three, six months of prison and 48 months of suspension from any public position. Okay. And the ruling was based on the failure, on the opinion of unconstitutionality of the court. The evidence uh, of the investigation led to that. Now, can you tell us who presented the criminal complaint against you? Former prosecutor Archimedes Sanz on July the 15th, 2009. Uh, when did this happen? 15 days after uh, Martinelli uh, became president of the Republic. In 2009, happened that. In, on what day did you order the phone tapping? The resolution is from August 17th, 2005. On what date the resolution was considered unconstitutional? That resolution is from July the 17th, 2007. I would like to ask you a second question. What was the role play uh, by the unconstitutional argument of the phone tapping? They used that as the evidence the resolution that I ordered in 2005, they used that. And then after the ruling of 2007, the prosecutor used that uh, opinion to uh, go against me. Those phone tapping, uh, did those phone tapping uh, activities happen? I understand they, they do not take place. They did not take place. How did you know about all these things that were happening? Though the group that was persecuting me was Pamago. They were a group of prosecutors that left the office of the general attorney when I took office because we reopened a huge case of corruption in the country. That is the case semis. Uh, that created a lot of enemies. And after that, there were several articles on several newspapers in Spain and in several uh, media outlets, and we had several sources that appear after uh, my ruling. The Ministry of Education of Martinelli went to your house, and for what? I could not remember, forget that. I was working at the National Assembly, uh, and on January the 1st of 2010, the Ministry of Education visited me. I was coming home, uh, you had the cameras, everything was registered. 
She sat and she told me, think about this. You need, what do you want? So that we can all keep our calm. So that's all. Thank you. I will stop asking questions so that my colleague Macarena Sanz can, can continue asking the questions. Ana Maria, we have only a few minutes. Can you let us know what happened with your professional career after the ruling? This is an stigma that I have been carried for 11 years. Every time that my name pops up because I have a professional possibility, nobody wants to give me a job. I knock the doors, but nobody wanted to give me a job. Everybody wanted to give me money. I was helped my, by my husband. I ended up being a teacher, but it was a great shame, even with the students. I'm a dean of a university, but I was also a university professor. I was a general attorney, and then I ended up becoming a professor at a high school. And all the time, I had to explain that I never listened to other people's conversations, that the abuse of power uh, needs to be um, uh, something that I know. I suffered a lot. I had to explain things before my family, before my friends. I have to defend myself everywhere because they are all the time saying that I'm doing phone, phone tapping. I have been dealing with this for 11 years. And I didn't imagine that this would affect me so, that much. But everyone that wants to disqualify me for a position always brings this to me. And why, if you are so painful, why are you uh, dealing with this? What do you want to get? Because it's important that in my country we have a stronger institutions. We include this in our petition. This is not only because of my students. I, most of them are here today. This is not only to uh, change the image of myself, but because we need justice and law. We don't want a justice operator to be the instrument of a president in a ruling. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for the motion. Now to the state to ask uh, questions for five minutes. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to address the new president of the uh, commission. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here. My name is Fada Urrutia. I am the representative for the Inter-American System of Protection of Human Rights of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs of Panama. So. If the if the petitioner is ready, from our point of view, we would like to focus our questions on an issue that we find very concerning and is one of the fights countries in Latin America have, which is the strengthening of institutions, especially the issue of uh, judicial independence, which was the last thing you mentioned. As you know, Panama has been fighting to strengthen the independence of justice. Several commissions and pacts were activated. So first of all, I wanted to ask something so you could have the opportunity to make a comment on this. During your entire petition, um, you make you mention the violation to your due process and we presented the entire supreme court file but i would like you to be more specific in saying exactly where you think was the um undermining of your process was it in the remedies in the way it was carried out could you be more specific well, there are many elements. I could start by saying that I presented several remedies that were motions for uh, recusation, for prescription, for um, for 
uh, vacancy and none of them were uh, accepted because I, I would send a document and they would change the conditions. So there was no way to uh, defend myself. But first of all, the case was first heard by a justice of the court that, as you know, was not independent because President Martinelli had appointed him uh, in a way that was illicit. Mr. Lamengor and he said on, on January 28th of 2000, 2010, five days after he was sworn in, I had precautionary measures that did not allow me to defend myself because I was left without a salary, so I could not pay for an attorney. They, I, they banned me from leaving the country, but they also uh, didn't give me the right to work, to be paid for my work. And on that precautionary measure, he Starting with the first precautionary measure, I was started to be convicted. And do you know what? Do you want to know something else about institutional independence? That ruling was sent to the Supreme Court that same day, when on the Constitution it said that I could leave someone in charge because I would be uh, investigated to see if I was innocent or guilty. I could give you a serious facts that occurred on that file that. Uh, show how justice was being manipulated, that there was no independence. Even from, we have been seeing issues since the uh, first ruling and the justices that were working with Martinelli were also doing that. Thank you very much. Now, with regards to what you were saying, and considering the future because part of the decisions that are being made when the Inter-American system for human rights are, is activated, there are some recommendations made to the country so that it can improve when uh, faults are found. So with that in mind, the state has taken part of the latest selection of justices, you had an opportunity to take part in those commissions back then as a representative of the uh, Legislative Assembly. So how do you think that pact is supporting the independence? Or do you think that we should be continue to improve the way in which justices and prosecutors are chosen? Well, if they listened to the recommendations, our country would be completely different. In 2005, when the Justice Arjona reported that there was manipulation, they called to this pact for the state of justice. And after that, great recommendations were made. For example, the comprehensive criminal reform or the justice of the peace and several reforms that, as you know, the uh, way or, or, for example, the progress of the um, work within the judiciary, and that has not been approved yet. And the mechanism to choose prosecutors and judges and justices. And apart from that, the a process like mine shows that you cannot judge the first prosecutor, especially uh, the administration prosecutor. I have one more question. Always trying to find a way to improve and strengthen our justice. From your point of view, the election of the general prosecutors of the nation have been different. What was the difference between your appointment as a prosecutor and the following prosecutors? The difference is not just the appointment. There are countries with good democracies where presidents make decisions. The problem is countries who, sorry, is presidents who meddle with the affairs of the prosecutors. So far, two prosecutors have resigned. And I told Mr. Martinelli on TV that I would not resign. I said that on TV, it's recorded. 
you will have to kill me, I will have to die, or you will have to incriminate me, you will have to frame me. Thank goodness I didn't kill myself because they want to manipulate the uh, office of the public prosecutor. The difference is the person who becomes the president because that person needs to respect the independency of the prosecutor's office. But you see what we have right now. And why do we have it? Well, because there have been no results in my case. If my case uh, is fruitful, then presidents will learn not to meddle with justice. And finally, my last question, do you think we could reach through, um, do you think we could reach a friendly settlement? Well, you will have to discuss that with my attorneys. You remember that you were part of the legal sector on the previous administration. I talked to the previous minister and she had gender sensitivity. So do you, you listened to me and we had this first intention and nothing else happened. So after that, you lose your faith. You say, ah, talk to the, the, the attorneys, talk to the system, but we need to fix this because if there are no consequences, then the institutionality of our country will be completely undermined. Thank you very much. That will be all for the state. Thank you. Okay, then we will move on to the questions of the commission. I will give the floor to the second vice president, Flavia Piovesan. Thank you very much, Madam President. I would like to uh, greet uh, the Washington College of Law, the petitioner and the representatives of the state of Panama. My first question, would you, do you think as a national prosecutor, did you have the warranties of independence that you need you needed to uh, to carry out your work during the five years? How did that happen? Because on this first question, I would like to, to know if you feel like you're being punished by refusing to be complicit in the acts of corruption by the president. Yes, of course, during the five, first five years, there was a lot of friction. The prosecutor needs to operate with two different presidents because that we do not have an immediate re-election. So the first president who appointed me, of course, I had uh, friction with him. We had three uh, ministers of education in jail. The uncle of the president was uh, was went to trial. We tried the biggest uh, corruption case in history by that time. And we managed to reopen it because when I became a prosecutor, it was close. So of course that led to a lot of friction. But when President Martinelli came to office, it was even worse. It was too blatantly obvious. In Costa Rica, there was the image of several former presidents who were in jail. And he said that he wanted one former president to go to prison. That was his goal. But Mr. President, that's not a matter of our willing if there are no causes for that, then we cannot send them to jail. So a very famous uh, paper in the country started to publish about some issue with a former president and a casino. And we said, let us do the investigation. But there was constant pressure. Even I received several calls. He, he even talked about me at the public assembly and he said do your work what work well he wanted me to do as he said because he wanted to control the public prosecution's office so when i was removed there were three other prosecutors for a position where only one should be so for one single president who should have had only one prosecutor and during that period there were four prosecutors. So quite honestly, of course, there was pressure. I was threatened 
with kidnapping, President Martinelli called me one day and said, Madam Prosecutor, your husband is on the list of a drug trafficker and he's in the country to kill him. Well, if my, can, if my husband is meddling with drug tra trafficking, then he should be killed. Uh, he said he would give me extra security. I knew what he was saying. He was saying that he would send his own people to my house so that they would know what I was doing. There was a lot of pressure. And after that, no one wanted to give me a job and I could sense how terrified people were. Martin, they uh, the um, tax office started investigating people Martinelli did not like. There was pressure, all kinds of pressure on Martinelli's enemies. So people started marginalizing me because being close to me was dangerous. Of course, not decent people. There were decent people in my country, but they did not understand what had happened because he was a newcomer and people believed that since he was a millionaire, he wouldn't steal. Huh, yeah, right. Thank you very much. So there was a sentence regarding the abuse of power and there were uh, the ruling included five votes in favor and four votes against. I know that five, the five votes or positive votes are from justices that were allocated by the president. Uh, do you have a judicial independence or not? I, I will explain to you. Out of those five, two of them, one of them was condemned. The president of the court was condemned because of crimes against public administration. She, he is in prison. The other is a prosecutor that, because of ethical reasons, uh, moved to the Security Council because, uh, because I accepted his resignation. That was appointed by Martinelli. Uh, the other was also appointed by Martinelli, and the other two that uh, their period expired in 2011. Those, one of those uh, gentlemen, you have the evidence on the file. Uh, he told me on a TV program, it was you or me, because he was recognizing that Martin, he asked Martinelli to let him continue being a justice. He wanted an extension of the period for another 10 years. And he recognized this publicly, that Martinelli called the justices, that Martinelli called him. Everything is proved. Those who do not want to realize or to understand this, they are living in a different country. And when, I would like to add something else. They did not go against me. The measure is, is take made on January 28th, five days after, the prosecutor is recused. And that happened at the beginning of 2010 because Martinelli at that time had the majority in the court. So he had the justices that he could control and they reached a majority in 2010. And that's why they start to act then because the sentence was ready in 2007, but when the government changed and when Martinelli had the majority, they decided to continue with the investigation. Can I ask you the last question? If the commission concludes that there is a violation in the merits report, taking into consideration the impact of the criminal procedure on your life and on your family, taking into consideration non-repetition guarantees, because what's important and is that there are no other victims like you, that there is a strengthening of the institutions. I would like to hear from you on what the reparation measures for you at an individual level and also at an institutional level. Of course, Mr. Mrs. Commissioner, I have a record. None of these corrupt politicians have the record that I have. I have a criminal record that affects my whole life project. I cannot have a career in justice in my country. The state of Panama, 
uh, presented myself, uh, presented me as a candidate for the Inter-American card and they had to remove that candidacy because I am condemned. I've been condemned for 11 years. I've lost 11 years of my life. They have damaged my life project. So I always, if I offer myself as a candidate for a popular or for a vote, I am one of the candidates I have more votes. I have a lot of votes because decent people knows what, knew what happened. But I have a lot of problems because I did not receive a salary because I was already exposed. Uh, I am already a pensioner, but I couldn't have the pension that I should have been entitled to. I need five years. Those that Martinelli stole from me, those are the five years that are left. I need public, I public um, apology. I know that law students that leave universities and that tomorrow will be the justices and the justices. We don't want them to manipulate law. Nobody can uh, administer justice. In order to administer justice, you have to have dignity and you have to be decent. Thank you, Mrs. Gomez. I would like to ask uh, the acting executive secretary if we could have an additional question. Thank you. Mrs. Gomez. Uh, thank you for being here today. We know that your situation is very difficult. I was thinking that at the time of the facts, you knew of any other similar case? Do you know if there were other cases in which an authority or an official received a sanction that the one, like the one that you received for front tapping? Uh, were there any precedents or, or other background cases? Mrs. In the history of the country, uh, there is no other example of an the opinion or ruler that is based on unconstitutionality to create this type of condemn. President, you are muted. Thank you. So I will give the floor now to Eduardo Guevara Hueto, that was a uh, superior prosecutor. Mr. Guevara. Mrs. President, I understand that he is joining the meeting right now. Good afternoon, Mrs. Mr. Guevara. Uh, your name is Eduardo Guevara Cuevas, is that right? I would need your uh, full name, your uh, place of birth and your place of residence. Eduardo Guevara Cueto. I was born in Madrid, Spain, and I reside in the city of Panama, in Panama. Thank you very much. We will start with your declaration. I will give the floor to the petitioner for the questions. Thank you very much, Mrs. President. Dr. Guevara, how many years have you been working the uh, at General Attorney's office when uh, Mrs. Gomez uh, took office at General Attorney and which other positions did you have after that? I was, I had 16 years of service in the public uh, prosecution office. After that, I was a circuit prosecutor. Then I was a superior uh, prosecutor, was also an anti-corruption prosecutor that was a prosecutor against organized crime. I was also Superior Prosecutor for the Republic, and I was also Civil Affairs Prosecutor and also Secretary for the uh, General Attorney's Office. And um, which were the practices of phone tapping before Gomez uh, took office? Article 18 of Law 23 uh, of that was then became that then became uh, Article Twenty Six of the Law on Drugs said that the general attorney was the one that had jurisdiction to authorize phone tapping, tapping if there were signals of serious crimes. And after the passing of the law, 
uh, from how many years the law was effective or if there was a change in the law. That uh, regulation remained effective until it was declared unconstitutional uh, that a general attorney authorized uh, a phone tapping. And this was after July the 17th, 2007. So from after 18 years of the beginning of the law, how many prosecutors were prosecuted because using this law? None of them, but for Ana Matilde Gomez. And when Mrs. Gomez took, took office, there was any change in the practice regarding phone tapping by the office of the general attorney? No, there were no changes. We proceeded according to the historical practice at the level of the institution. Can you explain the role of the general secretary, Ricardo Roberto Sanchez Montenegro, during the process against, or the procedure against Anda Matilde Gomez? The general secretary of the uh, general attorney's office had to present his resignation. He was judged by criminal authorities by a lower court. And this was because of the same facts for which uh, Mrs. Gomez was also trialed. It was within this a similar proceeding, but he was charged by a lower court and the investigation was carried by an anti-corruption prosecutor and the decision was made by a municipal or a local court. Uh, the um, third lower court of Panama uh, made an objective ruling. And this means that within the Panamanian system, during the phase of investigation, there was no prosecutions. Therefore, there were no sufficient evidence that confirmed the crime and the responsibility of the authors or perpetrators. I would like to quote, behavior that according to this court cannot be considered a crime of abuse of power according uh, against public servants because there was no real evidence that there was the intention uh, because he was convinced that the general attorney was the uh, authority that had the power to authorize these types of actions. Uh, how could you explain the different results or the different rulings or sentences in these two cases? I think that after the end of the criminal proceeding, the judicial authorities that were in charge of investigating and judging Dr. Rigoberto Gonzalez could without the influence that affect the main proceeding that is was against Mrs. Gomez, they could act with independence and impartiality. That was a difference. Dr. Guevara, many people in media outlets and in the press uh, that uh, saw in uh, Mrs. Gomez a symbol against corruption and Mrs. Gomez was voted by a great majority, but um, her sentence uh, did not allow her to be a representative in the National Assembly. You requested a reduction of her sentence. Why the uh, sentence of 48 months of suspension from public position was strange? It was strange and it was illegal. Uh, the regulation that most favorable, favorable, favorable that could be applied belong to the Criminal Code of 2007 that said that the sentence could not be, exceed the sentence for the main crime. The Supreme Court said that it should be six months of prison. Uh, the most favorable regulation uh was that so the period of time for the suspension could not be over six months however the supreme court of justice of panami uh in a 
violation of the law, applied an additional sentence of 48 months of suspension from public office. That is, that is to say 42 months over. We uh, use the uh, principle of proportionality which is the source of rational justice that has been so many times developed at the level of the inter-American system. But we also use the absence of the duty of motivation of the Supreme Court. If we review the uh, ruling of the court on page 27 on only four lines, the court basically announces that the penalty of suspension for the um, exercise of public function would be 48 months. And we mentioned a, set, a ruling of the Inter-American Court, which establishes that the decisions that, that could adopt domestic orders that have to do with um, human rights need to be justified. Otherwise, there will be arbitrary rulings. And in your professional and academic career, how many cases of retroactive application have you seen similar to this case of Mrs. Gomez? None, zero. It's a principle that is locally is accepted in the, according to the constitutional law of Panama, only the Supreme Court can declare that a provision is unconstitutional. And if this does not occur, then the provision is uh, in force. But for a ruling to, of inconstitutionality to be, become part of uh, the evidence, uh, one final question, Dr. Guevara. You worked at the public prosecutor's office for over 21 years. Do you think that the ruling um, undermined the institutionality of the public prosecution or of the judiciary or the legitimacy of public institutions? Yes. Criminal process against Ana Matilde Gomez and the interruption of her period as general prosecutor undermined our justice system. It had, it was symbolically very uh, important to see her being removed because of a crime she had not committed because the collective, uh, the collective image became that something terrible had happened. I remember that on August 12th, the day of the ruling, a human rights activist said, if this can happen in Panama to a national prosecutor, then what's left for the rest of the citizens? Thank you, Mr. Dr. Guevara or Mr. Guevara. Thank you so much then. We will move on to the uh, list of questions. Thank you very much, Madam President. Good afternoon, Mr. Guevara. Thank you for uh, being here. Would it be reasonable for cases involving general prosecutors to have a, a high profile because of the person involved? With that in mind, uh, you have said that this became a um, politics issue. Could you explain what you mean? Yes, I think that a very serious sign was the lack of uh, legal justification by the uh, court. For example, this um, this, uh, com this uh, ruling that said that she could no longer hold office, this additional, uh, because we, were, we verify the scope of it, this 48 months of suspension after the issuance of the 
uh, of the ruling up to August 2014. So it over, it actually uh, went beyond the electoral period of 2014. So she was suspended from being a public officer and also to be a political candidate. Actually, there's a, a ruling of the court that communicates this decision to the electoral tribunal or court. Now, if we consider the lack of arguments of legal substantiation of other uh, of the other arguments of the court, we could say that there was a political idea beyond behind the phrase this uh, opinion. The idea that it could uh, have a retroactive effect and declare her guilty is something completely ridiculous in the criminal law in Panama. And instead of using the instead of using the figure that was uh, applicable in this case, which had to do with phone tapping, uh, and the only penalty there was a fine, but the court decided to use a different crime, which is the abuse of authority that had nothing to do with the facts that were presented by the so-called victim. Thank you. As you mentioned, you were part of the public prosecutions for several years. And one, uh, did you ever request for authorization to tap phones? I did present requests to uh, tap certain phones. As we know, it's another instrument which is very important in case of serious crimes like extortive kidnappings, for example. And within the file, there are certain statements that were used for the criminal process that Mr. Sosa and his se general secretary took part in, where they said that when the transition was made to the new prosecutor and her team, they mentioned this issue about wiretaps. Do you know if that conversation occurred? Not that I'm aware of. I don't know about what was said, but I can say something. Article 26 of Act 13 of July 27, 1994, that was incorporated to the Drug Act, even after the uh, sentence of unconstitutionality of July 17, 2017, even after the modification of the Constitution of 2004, it's still in force. So this legal provision that was usually used on the institutional repression system was in force. because Article 29 had a, modi a modification that said that the interventions or wiretaps had to be ordered by legal authorities. And it's very interesting because the sentence of unconstitutionality has a special item signed by Mr. Arjona, which, which presents historic and uh, legal reasons why the public prosecutor's office is a legal authority. And this is relevant, and it is relevant, so relevant that he enumerates 15 cases in which when people wish to uh, deal with justice courts uh, would do that. So his interpretation, the dominating interpretation, is that what they were trying to do was separating the authorization of uh, wiretaps from administrative authorities. So 
there was an inter a sustained legal interpretation that the public prosecutor's office was a legal authority, a judicial authority, and had jurisdiction to order wiretaps through the national prosecutor, of course, with a reason, according to the cases established by the law when uh, there were uh, signs that it was necessary. And also, after the Constitutional Act of 2004, the state of Panama did not implement any sort of disposition that would replace the content of Article 26 of Act 1327, which was still in force. Thank you very much. That would be all for the uh, questions by the state. Then we will move on to the questions of the Inter-American Commission. I will give the floor to uh, Commissioner Piovesan. Thank you. I have a question. What was the reason for your resignation um, after the, um, the facts presented by Ms. Gomez? Matilde Gomez, uh, a poor, a poor, uh, attorney was uh, removed from uh, his pos her position uh, in 2010 because of ethical concerns. I decided to resign to my position as superior prosecutor after 21 years of service. Thank you, President. Uh, Mr. Guevara, I would like to ask you, because of your experience, you said that this was an emblematic case. You said, uh, I would like to know if you had, knew about similar proceedings or what could happen in similar cases where there is, have you, according to your experience, have you seen similar circumstances or similar cases? You have not seen another criminal procedure in which an unconstitutionality uh, ruling had had retroactive effects uh, for committing a crime like this one. This is something new. I haven't seen this in 31 years of experience. Thank you very much. We will start now with the stage of allegations. We will start with the allegations by the petitioner, and after that, those of the peti of the state. Each of the parties will have fifteen minutes for their presentation. We will start with the petitioner first. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. President. The petition of Mrs. Gomez against the state of Panama because of the violation of legal or judicial guarantees before the Inter-American Commission was presented on February 3rd, 2011. At that time, it was enough to see the proceeding and the ruling to see that Mrs. Gomez was um, prosecuted or sentenced for complying with his role as general attorney. He decided, she decided to order the phone tapping to, uh, to uh, uh, investigate the extortion of a person by a prosecutor. And then there was an accusation that uh, the general attorney had no position, had no authority to order that. While all the prosecutors up to that time have been able to do the same thing. The general attorney needed to know in 2005 what the Supreme Court decided in 2007. And she committed a crime of abuse of power against a person who was not listened to, who was, whose phone was not tapped. So there was no type of crime, there was no subject that was affected and there was no intention. So there was no objective responsibility, that is intention. So there is something that is objective that the general attorney gave the order of phone tapping following a law that had been effective for 18 years. We have an amicus curiae that was presented in this case and according to European and international standards, even general attorneys should benefit from uh, jurisdictional immunity when they uh, carry out acts in good faith. Uh, prosecutors and judges 
and should not be considered responsible for decisions that are based on its legal analysis. The process or the proceeding against Mrs. Gomez is an absurd. But for the fact that there was a clear logic behind, the goal was to get uh, rid of, of Mrs. Gomez, who decided not to be controlled by any president. And uh, she, wanted, she did not want to be manipulate, manipulated by uh, Martinelli. The general uh, prosecutor investigated three ministries and several public officials, even family members of the president were questioned. The loyalty of Mrs. Gomez is to the Panamanian law. When we presented this petition before the commission, Ricardo Martinelli was still a president, president of Panama and there was a lot of information was coming out. In May, 2011, uh, the newspaper La Estrella published several communications with the embassy of the United States and the embassy of Panama. For example, one of those cables for communication said the following. Para acusarla. In, so, Pamago Group and Martinelli wanted to remove her from public life, and that's why she received that supplemental sentence of 14, 48 months. Year 2013, the editor of uh, newspaper La Prensa wrote in a book that in January 2010, Ricardo Martinelli went to his house and told him that they wanted to remove Ana Matilde Gomez. She, he told me that he had talked with some of the justices in the court to remove her. They, we have also different complaints and everything, documents that in which the, some of the prosecutors talk about the Pamago group and some of their actions. In 2014, Alberto Silva Rejo is one of, who was one of the justices that failed against Mrs. Gomez said on a TV program that Martinelli was always calling the justices of the Supreme Court. Uh, court. All interrupt us. And she told Mrs. Gomez and is cry to Gomez. Now you are asking me for an explanation for what I did to you. The trial before the Supreme Court in uh, 2014 uh, said that the supplemental sentence was incorrect and the Supreme Court reduced the supplemental sentence to six months because they recognized that 48 months was an excessive sentence. Several of the justices that failed against Mrs. Uh, Gomez resigned or were prosecuted for corruption crimes. Uh, the words of uh, the justice always explain this. They always call us. Martinelli called uh, Mrs. Gomez seven times a day. This is what she said. Panama has a structural problem and the consequences were not suffered only by Mrs. Gomez. Any general attorney of the country has been able to finish his or her period without the intervention of the executive power or the politicians. Uh, Mrs. Gomez has suffered the damage of the trial. She's suffering the damage of a stigma and she was condemned for a crime that she need, did not commit. And, at different uh, periods of time, uh, the same obstacle appears because of a crime that she did not commit. She, her commitment uh, took her to the Congress because she was a representative with most votes, but she could not uh, took office. She is now the dean of one of the most prestigious universities in the country. And she's a dean that has been condemned by a crime. Mrs. Gomez was also appointed as a candidate for the International Court, uh, Inter-American Court of Human Rights. The, uh, immediately after the candidacy, many sectors said that she could not be a candidate. That means 
this case is all the time interrupting the life and we have a recurrent revictimization of Mrs. Gomez. I would like to give the floor to Dr. Grosso. Thank you very much, Macarena Science. I would like to greet the commissioners again and also the representatives of the state. The representatives of the state were asking if we were willing to have a friendly settlement agreement for a friendly settlement agreement could happen. However, in this hearing, we need to have a recognition of the responsibility on the part of the state. And if the state commits to eliminate all the consequences of the actions against our uh, client and everything that uh, and all the effects of the sentence against hers, and also we want that everything should be done within a deadline of three months. And now I would like to talk about uh, the substance of the case. Uh, lawyer science, Macarena Science has talked about the statements and the facts. I would like to talk about the Inter-American Commission and we would like to repeat some of the things that we have mentioned in our writings. At the first time, we have a flagrant violation of Article 8, Paragraph 1 of the Inter-American Convention and of the American Convention related to Articles 1 and 2. And there is also a violation of the Article 1 of the American Convention. Article 8, 1 and 2 of the American Convention say that there should be a right to a competent, impartial and competent court. There is a presumption of innocence and there is a right to appear uh, before the court, all those persons that can provide information regarding the facts. And there is also the right to go to a second instance. So Article 25, every person has the right to a simple and quick trial or any other effective proceeding before a competent uh, uh, court. Article one talks about the duty after the case of Mark Frank Velasquez, so that there is a legal system that allows for the exercise of the rights by all citizens in a peaceful manner. The facts that we have presented today and that have not been discussed by the state show that there has been a fragrant violation. The initial proceeding go against Mrs. Gomez was carried out before an incompetent, incompetent court. Uh, Oscar Seville, that was the prosecutor of the administration, uh, excused himself because he issued his opinion and ordered that the case was taken by his personal substitute. And he appointed Mrs. Rogas, that was the one that promoted the case. And he was the prosecutor in charge. But according to the legislation of Panama, was indicated in the petition, the substitute needs to be appointed by the president of the Republic with the uh, approval of the cabinet and with the approval of the National Assembly. She was not judged by an independent and impartial court as we have said here. We don't have much time uh, to talk about each of the components of this. But it would be enough to say that the president of the court was condemned because of a corruption case. Another justice had to resign and that Almegor and Sainz were appointed by President Martinelli. The appointment does not uh, indicate that they are guilty, but Almengor, however, was one of the architects of the group of the group Pamago. There was a group that wanted to harm Mrs. Gomez because he ha she had a complex relationship with the group because of ethical issues. And our client already talked about those issues. After that, what I can say is that he was replaced by Wilfredo Sainz. And Wilfredo Sainz is the substitute of Almengor and he accepted the case even though he had a conflict of interest because he was publicly questioned by Mrs. Gomez, our client. And as I was saying, we have the case of Alejandro Mocaluna. Uh, he was condemned uh, because of 
faking and he complied with the sentence in prison. We repeated all the elements regarding the independence of the judiciary that are in our documents and writings. The presumption of innocence was violated and all of us know that precautionary measures cannot prejudge. I would like to read the text of the precautionary measures. The text say the following, establishing that she was being uh, suspended from the position. It's unforgivable that a committed official uh, does not know and apply uh, basic constitutional regulations and the body of law in the matter. She cannot be ignoring this. This is are two different concepts. This has to do with application. I will stop there because we know this. We are all as law experts, and that means prejudging the merits of the case. Uh, I also would like to add that what Macarena says, says was uh, saying, in this case, phone tapping never took place. And that were the object of a constitutional interpretation of a law years later after the ruling and the sentence of this corrupt prosecutor. And two years after that decision or ruling on constitutionality, the uh, general attorney is requested to leave her position and she acted according to defective law at that time. And there was a crime that, uh, or an act that didn't take place. So that is uh, very sad because they are going against criminal law by making up a crime without intention. And this is something that seems quite funny and ridiculous. The president did not comply with the requirements of previous communication, did not grant the uh, Mrs. Gomez the necessary times to prepare her defense. And she said this without being controversial. There were several motions that were not taken into consideration. Mrs. Gomez was removed from her functions and condemned for abuse of power without having the possibility of going to a higher court. According from the in the case of La Tablada, that was established as a violation of the American Convention of Human Rights. Also, there was a violation, as you know, the lack the lack of retroactivity of criminal law, and also the most favorable enforcement of the law is the one that should be applied. We have a retroactive enforcement of the law for an act that was not a crime and with an interpretation that did not exist. And in order to create a crime without intention. So there was a new interpretation of the law, but the criminal law reform was not applied that would reduce the sentence because she was granted 48 months of sentence. That goes against the criminal law. So the goal was to silence the voice of a person that was fighting corruption at that time. There was also a violation of Article 9 regarding the retroactivity of criminal law that says clearly that nobody can be uh, prosecuted or condemned for an act that was not a crime according to the criminal law at that time. And this mention has to do with the retroactive application or enforcement of criminal law. And what has happened in criminal law that is less severe or less serious. We have included this in our petition and uh, we have included this as additional supplemental details to the petition. There was also a violation of Article 5 of the American Convention because the removal or the arbitrary removal of Mrs. Gomez represented a huge violation or serious violation of human rights, as I have explained uh, and as my colleagues have explained uh, recently. Now, the 
international community, both uh, the um, Attorneys Association presented a report that we added, and there's a technical report about the um, the crime of authority and a technical uh, report by Carlos Pedreche, who is a very famous, Pedreche, a very famous um, expert from Panama. And there was a very similar case and also with a woman. That's interesting, isn't it? In this case, it was the first woman attorney in uh, Panama. In the case of the European court, it was the first woman as well. So that's how we could see how clear it was to protect with due process, of course, prosecutors. So as an educator, I've taken part in the preparation of uh, texts for international competition for competitions for students. And this case would be no good for that text because there needs to be a possibility for the defense of a state. And the state of Panama has made contributions, very positive contributions with the ratification of the Inter-American Commission. This is a case in favor of the of human rights and of justice and the law. So we request to reach a final session unless there's a friendly settlement. And after we've presented all our evidence, we believe that justice needs to finally be made on an issue that is so evident for everyone. Now I will give the floor to the presentation of the state and you will have one additional minute. Thank you very much, Madam President. Madam Commissioners, representatives from the Executive Secretariat, Madam Petitioner, Ana Matilde Gomez, Mr. Witness, Eduardo Guevara. This, we, we are part of this uh, virtual session within the framework of this period of sessions of the Commission. Our government recognizes the uh, how this commission protects human rights and is always trying for states within with their own institutions to uh, see if they uh, they are comply with international standards ever since canada adopted the convention it was always constructively committed to the institutionality of the Organization of American States. And it's one of the 20 countries that uh, accepts the jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court. That is why we come to this commission with our greatest respect to express our considerations in a show of transparency and accountability of the system in reference to this case after we were summoned back in February. Commissioners, the state would like to express that during the analysis process of this file presented by the petitioner because of the violation of, of the alleged violation of articles 8, 9, 25 on legal protection, 5, on the right to personal integrity, Article 11 on the protection of honor, and Article 22 on the right to um, travel. And we made presentations of the documents and considerations and the entire file uh, that is based in the Republic of Panama. Panama. Through that information, our objective was to provide procedural pieces that would allow us to respect the warranties of the petitioner during this process on uh, of the um, of the the case for abuse of authority. 
but after the admissibility report was received back on October 16, 2018, the state acknowledging the observations made on this report and as a show of its respect and commitment to the inter-American system as a vehicle to consolidate the rule of law and democracy in the Americas started to approach the petitioner trying to find a friendly settlement. This first approach took place on November 27th and 2018 at the Directorate for uh, Legal Affairs in our Ministry for Foreign Affairs, where uh, the petitioner presented the measures she was requesting. So on May 2019, the government of Panama formally notified the Executive Secretariat of the Commission of Human Rights its intention to start a process of friendly settlement, which was accepted by the Commission on July 30th, 2019. But after this offer by the state of Panama to start a process of friendly settlement and before the communication by the Executive Secretariat to the petitioner, the representatives of Ms. Gomez presented on May 13, 2019, additional considerations following the, reg the rules of the Commission requesting for the issuance of the merits report, which was done on January 2021. So commissioners, after the emission, the Ministry for Foreign Relations started an approach to the pertinent authorities of the government of Panama and to the petitioner aiming at starting a consulting process of friendly settlements that in our practical experience is an efficient mechanism to find solutions, alternate solutions to legal conflicts that stem from the claims for the fundamental rights of humans. The state of Panama is aware of the need to work on strengthening the independence of the judiciary and the high purposes and principles that in including the appointment of prosecutors and justices in order to promote and to strengthen the rights of other persons that uh, go to justice. Panama, that is a state party of the OAS, recognizes uh, the ruling of the Inter-American Court as a case, each are just in uh, the key paragraph uh says that uh the resources are there and the judicial power sometimes lack the capacity to decide in an impartial way because they lack the information to make a decision this could be uh an unjustified, unjustified delay and also the uh lack of access to justice for the victims. The state of Panama remedies. has been working so for, many, been years working for many years to improve and to consolidate the judicial of independence of the and to promote the strengthening of, the judiciary, of such a body of the state. And, and have has participated in several thematic hearings in the region on this that have been summoned uh, by, held the by the commission as a show of, that of its commitment. The state of Panama recognizes that it needs to the efforts of the international part of the efforts of the international to community and to define some progress uh, that strategic policies that will war warranty all that all human beings can, can participate part and enjoy the development the of our nations of human with a, with humanist, a humanistic uh, point humanist. of view perspective aimed at uh, developing into consideration uh, the inherent the rights, rights of, all human of persons every in this human context, being. So it is important to, to say stress that since the presentation the, of the petition uh, under study, the, the, the uh, study was presentation, presented, 
regarding criminal law that shows the government of the state to comply with the compliance of actions to promote, protect, and guarantee the fundamental guarantees of human rights of all persons that go to part in criminal processes. These efforts are closely related to the rights that the petitioner says that have been violated. Uh, For example, those efforts have been the, made the uh, Pact of State Pact for Justice. We have mentioned it in our initial, initial petition since 2005. Was, uh, we have the political commitment to establish a participative to establish process a when selecting justices mechanism for the Supreme to Court. This is an effort to provide transparency and rigorosity to the selection of the justices when in order choosing to the members of the judiciary so that they can be impartial and impartiality for the exercise of their function. Also, the also implementation we are implementing accusatory, a criminal um, uh, system for that, criminal justice, that which is one of one the most, the most relevant, relevant tasks uh, that has been a the promise, justice system promoted has by public, in the past decade, uh, the promotion the by decade. the entire Supreme uh, Court of the control we are trying of to apply the and we are its trying integration to, to the analysis of the national legislation in order, order to provide the national system, system with the, the norms and regulations of international, international law that, that are included at the minimum American in the American Convention. Convention. So regarding with regards to the case that, that is of criminal uh, nature dealing and with right now, uh, which is a criminal to case and is uh, that could be applicable to high-profile officials and that are judged by the Court, and in particular uh, the, or the right Supreme Court, the, we to um, have the effective remedy. Uh, we have a uh, ruling issued by our Supreme Just, uh, court, court of Justice which that stresses that, that is not unconstitutional uh, the constitutionality article of Article 96 of the, of the uh, criminal procedural um, establishes code and establishes uh, mechanisms to implement the Panama mechanism is of working now uh, to revision. Reflect on a we are now working that is a, on the pact um, of the bicentennial, pact, and we are trying which seeks to have to have an ethical state. state. An ethical state. Uh, and we want to plan the uh, country that we want Panama for the next want. 10 years. An unheard this of is an opportunity that gives all citizens uh, an opportunity did not to design future, a better country by showing a commitment to the country is for that having will benefit a the citizens of Panama. Process. Panama Panama Officials, recognizes we recognize that on this petition, that in petition initial steps were uh, taken were in order to reach a friendly in order settlement to where a friendly unfortunate, settlement unfortunately, agreement, but there, there has been no progress made. There was so no the progress, and that of the is why the representatives the commission of the petition asked for the issuance the of a merits of report. Of so the government of Panama, considering the different aspects this particular of this case, case said that they are interested in promoting uh, a friendly uh, settlement agreement Friendly with the support of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights that would help the, control uh, the process of friendly settlement so that uh, following can what uh, says what Article 40 so the, the, that the Executive the Secretary can assess so the that the um, of such, Executive uh, Secretariat process. can oversee and, the process and uh, see if, not if a merits uh, report should be merits report should be issued President, or not. Mrs. Commissioners, uh, Madam President, uh, Madam uh, Petitioner, Mrs. our government stresses the government its commitment to uh, offer warranties its commitment and have recognized the need to improve. And to improve its actions in the area of human rights. The uh, uh, use of a process of objectivity and we are trying to adequate our national legislation to those of the Inter-American Commission, especially taking into consideration those points that are considered within the report 124 slash 18 of the commission. The government of the Republic of Panama respects and recognizes the system of human rights and therefore believes that based on an honest dialogue, we can address the different the differences between citizens and those 
uh, allegations because they consider they, that their rights have been violated. That state of Panama says that believes that with a joint efforts, it would be possible to consolidate the trust of society on its institutions and their institutions. Therefore, we reconsider that the recommendations and commitments of this hearing will be a great guide and a motivation for the dialogue that should be uh, with uh, the institutions of a state in order to strengthen uh, the culture of understanding as a fundamental axis for the protection of human rights and fundamental rights. Thank you very much. Thank you for to the representative of states. I will give the floor to Commissioner Pivasan for the questions that she may have. Thank you, President. At this time, I would like to listen to the representatives of the petitioner and also to the representative of the state of Panama so they can uh, discuss the possibility of a friendly settlement. The state uh, notifies uh, the commission on in March 2019. I agree with Professor Grosso that this is a case not against Panama, but in favor of Panama, but it's a possibility of strengthening the institutional, the democratic institutions of Panama. And uh, with the transparency and the commitment of the commission of mediating the dialogue between the parties of facilitating with all the expertise, the building or the construction of a friendly settlement so as country reporter for Panama, I would like to listen to the petitioner uh, to see which are the measures and also which are the reparation measures essential or the essential reparation measures uh, taking into consideration the victim's perspective. But also I would like to know which are the structural measures and the non repetition measures that should be implemented, which are the key measures, and which are the consensus or points in this dialogue promoted by the state. And I would like to know which are the disagreements. And I have the same question for the representatives of Panamanian state, because I think this is a time, this is a privileged situation. This is strategic time. So we need to find, uh, to develop and uh, this mechanism that is friendly settlement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I will not make any questions, so I will give the floor to the petitioner first and then to the representatives of the states. You have five minutes. So we are seeing a fragrant violation of the national legislation and the regulations that apply to Panama. We have uh, prepared a detailed uh, writing regarding that. And we are not talking about the abstract thing. We are seeing a rejection of justice or a denial of justice that have has dramatic effects on the life of a person, a person who was not able to work, who suffered a lot uh, from a personal perspective being removed after 10 years of her appointment, her career was interrupted and she was presented before the public as a criminal so, or as a, we need to erase all the consequences. Let's, I think if one of if ourselves were attacked or our dignity uh, were attacked. So we, you cannot erase a ruling. And the recent signs or the recent effects of that ruling are still present. She was no longer a candidate for the Inter-American Court because of that. And in the document that was prepared to withdraw her candidacy, this is the reason why. People are saying that she has a ruling. And in order to be a member of the Inter-American Court, 
you have to comply with all the requirements regarding uh, your performance in the judicial power. Part of her pension uh, was cut. She also suffered economic damage, economic hurt. She was a person that could survive or that could maintain or uh, take care of her family. Her income was destroyed and she became then a professor in a high school and the government calls, called the school to ask them to stop hiring her. There were some family members. Uh, she cannot go to the graduation of her son. So we have a very important moral and material damage here or harm. But taking into consideration reparation measures in the Inter-American system, comprehensive reparation should be comp compensation for the material damage uh, everything that has to do with the time that she was not able to work and also moral harm uh, and also measures of non-repetition, non-repetition measures should be taken. This cannot happen again. And there should be measures to guarantee that. In the case of Chile, it was very important that President Alwin asked for uh, apologizes for the violations committed during uh, the case of Chile. Anyone that has worked in the area of human rights knows that that apology is essential and is important. So, but here we have a difference regarding the facts. It is always important to find a solution, to find a settlement, but we need to have a dialogue, exchange of ideas. This is, is the exercise of rights of a person. And 11 years have passed so far and there has been no justice. No friendly settlement is required to recognize what has happened. You should know that the state of Panama has not rejected, it has not contradicted the says that we have said. They are not saying nothing about the sentence against the justice of the Supreme Court. She, they have not said nothing about the justices or the substitute prosecutor. In a previous situation, the crime, uh, the we have also an invention or a new thing that is a crime without invention and not saying or not rejecting that is because you admit that that existed. So uh, I have always participated in friendly settlement agreements, but the first thing for a dialogue of that type, we invite the government of Panama to recognize and acknowledge their responsibility for the violations committed against our client. That is the first thing recognition or acknowledgement of their responsibility. Second, we need to commit to address all the consequences derived from a criminal ruling for which a person was deprived of their right to a pension. And third, we need to establish a deadline of three months if they want to find an agreement. And I would like to say something else. Both Macarena Science and myself, we are not private lawyers. Uh, that is, we, you don't have to take into consideration our fees because we are acting for free. And the same is doing Eduardo and all the lawyers that have supported us. The same happened with the College of Lawyers of Panama because they say that this was a fragrant violation of law. And as you know, you know that a friendly settlement agreement is something that we value. We value your this, uh, willingness 
there are some differences regarding who was contacted and when, but regarding the current circumstances, we need these things to be recognized. Recognition or acknowledgement of responsibility, erasing all the consequences and an adequate deadline of three months. If you think that there is no previous cases with this, I can mention some. I have some friendly friend settlement cases that were based or constructed from the acknowledgement of responsibility. That sets the starting point for this. And I also would like to say that I recognize and I acknowledge and I appreciate that the state of Panama is ready to reach a friendly settlement. So we not need to work. We need to have these three things done. I don't want to repeat them more. I don't want to waste uh, your time. So after that, we can move forward. Otherwise, we will continue with the re-victimization of Mrs. Gomez. She will not accept that because she needs to have a real feeling of justice. I would like to give the floor to the state with an additional minute. Thank you, Mrs. President. I would like to thank the allegations presented by the representative of the petitioner. The government of Panama recognizes that during the time it worked in the friendly solution proposal, we made several consultations and there are some issues that could be advanced. So we agree fully that if the petitioner accepted what you have said and if the state of Panama accepted this friendly settlement proposal, it should be done within a short period of time. And we uh, are giving the option of having the expertise of experts of members from the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights because we as a foreign ministry do not have the skills or we do not have the expertise to make a formal opinion. But I think that the experts will have the discussions and the negotiations with the other uh, agencies and areas of government. So in that regard, taking into consideration the three proposals and petitions made by representative, we are going to acknowledge uh, and eliminate uh, the sentence. We can accept that everything will be done within a short period of time. That is fair by taking into consideration that the petitioner uh, has been fighting for 11 years. That is a very long period of time. We have friendly settlements agreements that have been uh, solved very quickly. So in that regard, we accept a short deadline to solve this. And as Mrs. Mr. Grosso said, this is a dialogue. We have made already, act, have taken actions that we can activate together with the petitioner and we can use the technical or the executive secretariat to help us with those dialogues or exchanges in order to solve those things that are still under discussion. And after that, and with, if within that deadline, then if that is not possible, we can continue with the merits reports or we find a friendly settlement agreement based on what the petitioner has presented. Thank you. I would like to ask Commissioner Piovesan if she has any additional question. Yes, I have, uh, I need a clarification by the state. So the proposal of the state is to have a deadline to react to the three proposals, the acknowledgement of responsibility by the state, uh, cover all the facts of the sentence, and then uh, have a reasonable deadline to apply those measures. 
this is my clarification. I don't know if the state is requesting for a deadline. I would like to know the duration of that deadline so that the petitioner part or the petitioners can evaluate this. We would have to work on the numbers and the calculations then we would have to start different sorts of dialogue with the institutions. I understand that the petitioner said three months. I don't know if it's possible to do that. I would like uh, you to reflect maybe on a six month period. If you think uh, it's possible so that we can carry out that process so that uh, the uh, meeting, so that you will see that the meetings are happening, that we are uh, achieving results. And in the case of a friendly settlement, as the representative of the petitioner, of course, there will be an apology because, in an apology, sorry, it's part of the process, but that includes that if non-repetition measures should be agreed on, as the system indicates, this improves the conditions and that would actually help our state to improve its practices and strengthen our institutionality. We have about half a minute so that in order to move forward, with this, uh, go on. It's very important to know if the state will uh, ask to, to will recognize its responsibility, because the basis of all processes of friendly settlements are is um, the basis is the recognition of responsibility, accountability. So, uh, as the petitioner said, there cannot be a friendly settlement after 10 years without the state acknowledging its responsibility. Otherwise, we see the good faith, but it would be better expressed in the recognition of guilt. And then we would need the state to uh, stress that the measures that come from the stem from the sentence will be lifted. Why? Because the purpose, if the purpose of that is to is to have an argument or not, if there if there is responsibility or not, and as we said, it's been ten years, so that's not what we want to discuss here. We don't need the other part. We respect the state of Panama, and we also respect the commission, of course. And we know that many friendly settlements were preceded by an acknowledgement of responsibility, and in this case, eliminating the consequences. What we're seeing is so clear. I won't say it again, but they need to commit to lifting to removing the consequences, um, because otherwise it would be uh, uh, wasting our times, the time of the commission, the time of the state, and the time of the petitioner. Would we want the commission to be there? Of course, but on the basis of a compliance of these requirements. And once that has occurred, then we will uh, after uh, maybe a week, you just have to check with your government. We don't want to put you uh, in an uncomfortable position. That's not what we want. You don't need to give us an answer right now. We are always trying to give others uh, 
the best possibilities to work. But without those three requirements, what could we do? So let's give them a deadline so that they can answer to these requirements. Thank you, Mr. Petitioner. So unless the state of Panama would like to reply now, um, part of what's preventing us from I would like to thank, thank you all. And of course, uh, um, I would like to, first of all, thank you, thank all the parties for their goodwill because of their um, statement that they would uh, say yes to a friendly settlement, but perhaps in a period, in a term of 10 days, the state could reply in a written form with a roadmap on these requests presented by the petitioner. If you agree, then in 10 days from now, we would receive that reply, that written response. Secondly, any additional document that if you'd like to present anything else after today, that you would like to add to this t uh, case, Uh, you can do so. We would like to appreciate the presence of the petitioner and the state. We know that friendly settlements are a mechanism that depend on the parties, that depends on the parties. And the commission always is there for both parties to reach this solution if both parties decide that that's what they want. So I really appreciate your being here. I also would like to greet everyone here and Madame Gomez, I would like to greet you especially because I know this is a very difficult situation, but the commission would like to thank all parties for their willingness to uh, reach a settlement. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Bye. Bye. Thank you.